Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Uh, happy uh, to be back for a tax talks, which uh, I think a number of you were expecting. Uh, we have uh, records of uh, people registered today for a tax talk on an update on the work we're doing to address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy, but that's something like a special day today because we're trying to come up with some form of concrete proposals. These are just secretariat proposals, no consensus yet on these, uh, but we're hopeful that this may uh, help moving forward. Um, you are welcome to send any question uh, you may have. Uh, they will be um, uh, taken into account and circulated to us so that we can respond to you by the end of this one hour uh, webcast. You have the address here and if you are a tweeter, don't hesitate to tweet uh, and you have the uh, hashtag. Um, in introduction, for introduction, uh, let me present my uh, co-panelist, uh, Richard Collier, uh, who is uh, the brain behind the unified approach under Pillar 1, and he will be best placed to explain to you uh, what he has in mind and which is now on paper. We have Sophie Chatel, who you know well too, who's the head of the tax treaty unit, dealing with a significant chunk of this work under uh, the uh, approach on the pillow one. Uh, Arim Pros, uh, all of you know him because, as he would say, beyond pillow one, there is pillow two. And uh, Arim, uh, of course, is involved in pillow one, helping brainstorm in the, with the team, but also uh, is the mastermind of uh, pillow two. And we welcome a, a newcomer to the tax talks, uh, Osa, Osa Johansson, I got it wrong, uh, Osa Johansson, I think it's better. Uh, she's the head of Structural Policy Surveillance Division in the Economic Department. Uh, she will um, talk uh, about the impact assessment uh, work, which is co-led by uh, David Bradbury and uh, Osa. Osa is from another department at the OECD, because most of you may have not known, but beyond the Center for Tax Policy and Administration, there are many other very important direct threats at the OECD, one of them dealing with uh, economic matters and the work we do on the impact assessment is a joint work uh, between them and us uh, because that requires a lot of um, data analysis and uh, brainstorming and we had to join uh, forces um, to get there. Uh, what we will be talking about today, um, Pillar 1, uh, of course, after I've tried to set uh, up the scene of uh, why we are where we are today and what the philosophy, what the philosophy is uh, of the unified approach. So we'll have a lengthy presentation of the secretariat proposal for this uh, unified approach under Pillar 1. Then we'll move to an update uh, on what we call the GLOBE proposal, uh, the multilateralization of guilty or the installation of minimum tax, global minimum tax, and ARIM will do. And finally, as I mentioned, the impact uh, assessment, economic analysis and impact assessment, uh, which OSA will uh, present to you. And we'll try to explain what the next uh, steps uh, will be. Most of you know about the background, but still, um, uh, in case there are newcomers, it uh, would be good uh, to remind you of the basics there. We launched PEPS in 2012-2013 and we delivered 15 measures at the end of 2015. One of them was Action 1 report on the digital economy, the conclusions of which were, well, that, not that conclusive. Uh, they were on VAT, they were on the fact that we shouldn't talk about the digital economy but about the digitalization of the economy, but they were not in terms of finding a solution in terms of corporate income tax or a global solution to ensure that uh, digital uh, companies uh, would be uh, uh, paying their taxes where they operate, including in the markets where they have clients or users. Uh, this resulted in uh, frustration, big frustration for many countries, planting the seed of unity unilateral measures in the mind of many policymakers across the world. And in 2017, February, in Baden-Baden, the uh, German presidency of the G20, at that time Minister Schäuble, asked the OECD to do a report uh, to show progress. And this report was delivered in March 18, um, 
the head of schedule, and this interim report actually showed real progress. It was no longer the time where uh, some countries would say we'll never enter a conversation into uh, on, on, on that uh, topic, but rather we all recognize that something needs to be done. And, and that was something extremely important in this report, which analyzed the different features of the digital business models, but also recognized that uh, more had to be done. Throughout 2018, the Task Force on the Digital Economy examined the different options, the different ideas, and all that translated into the adoption of a policy paper at the end of January 2019, a few months ago. And this policy paper basically stated that, one, there was a need for a solution, Two, that the inclusive framework members, the 134, that time I think it was 129 countries on an equal footing working in the inclusive framework, they agreed that a solution had to be explored through two pillars, pillar one on um, nexus and profit allocation and the pillar two on a global uh, minimum tax. So that was the policy note, which introduced also something a bit unusual in OECD literature, which was the fact that under pillar one, solutions would um, uh, go beyond the arms length principle. Solutions, because at that time we had three concurrent proposals uh, on the table, we'll come back to that. And finally, uh, in May, the inclusive framework uh, adopted a program of work to implement this policy paper. Mm -hmm. However, the program of work as regards uh, Pillar 1 recognized that we would need to move towards what we would call a unified approach if we wanted to deliver anything uh, likely to reach consensus in 2020, because with the three concurrent proposals, we were not in good shape on that front. Um, where are we today? Well, a reminder there. I think everybody would recognize that there are significant strains in the system, the international tax system, the international tax rules uh, are, are stressed, distressed. Why so? Because uh, countries are not happy with them, a number of countries, and that's across the board, not only non-OECD countries unhappy with OECD rules, but within the OECD, a number of countries recognizing that even after BEPS, there is some more work to be done, in particular to address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy. And this translates into unilateral measures, this translates into further audits, this translates into this unhappiness, uh, which is not conducive to tax certainty, which is not conducive to uh, a good uh, investment environment. As I told you, three proposals were made to address the uh, reallocation of taxing right among jurisdictions. A few words about these three proposals. One spelled out by the UK but supported by many other countries, in particular European countries, saying what is new in the system, what is new in the world coming from digital, the digitalization is the fact that you have business models where companies will suck the data of our people and monetize this in a third country. And this is what we want to tax. We, we just want to focus on highly digitalized business models. Uh, E-sales and other e-transactions e are not necessarily new uh, because there has always been cross-border transactions, including without a physical presence on the territory. We don't necessarily want to change that, but where there is a highly digitalized business model, we need new rules. We, you had another proposal uh, which was spelled out by a number of countries and I would say the US was one of them, and that's the follow-up of the US tax reform, the fact that I think the US has um, rethought itself in terms of international uh, tax uh, matters. Uh, and this approach was uh, entitled the um, uh, marketing intangible approach, meaning that we should recognize more taxing rights uh, to markets where there is uh, a big return, excess return, above normal return, because then there is an interaction with the market, a sustainable engagement in the market through advertisement or through this marketing intangible, therefore one should disentangle the marketing intangible from the rest of the intangible to allocate it to the market. And finally, there was an approach supported and sponsored by India, 
Colombia, and on behalf of the G24, which is a group of developing countries which have their own secretariat based at the IMF uh, and uh, who work together promoting a significant economic presence, the scope of which being quite limited to cases where there is a significant economic presence, meaning beyond the permanent establishment or presence through a subsidiary, but in case of a significant economic presence, there should be a fraction, I mean, a, 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 a fraction and apportionment of profit to uh, the uh, market uh, jurisdictions. And that's where we left it, uh, and that's where, again, we said in the program of work, we cannot leave it there. We must move to a unified approach. We can identify horizontal uh, technical work streams, and we can start these work streams, but still, uh, we need to unify all these if we want to have a chance to have an agreement in 2020, which clearly is supported politically, and that's the last point on this slide, high-level political commitment that you could find in the G20, that you could find in the G7, in Biarritz over the summer, and that you can also find in many governments, uh, in some campaigns here and there where there are political campaigns, this topic of the tax challenges, the digitalization of the economy uh, are regularly uh, mentioned. Therefore, uh, the OECD Secretariat uh, has uh, decided uh, to try to move away from the deadlock to help, and even though it's quite unusual that uh, we do communicate on Secretariat's views, we are doing it here to facilitate a conversation between countries, to help them move forward towards a common approach. So what we are presenting today, and I think it's extremely important um, uh, to understand, is a secretariat view. What does that mean? Well, that it doesn't bind any member countries, which means that it's a big announcement which is not that big, because maybe countries will say we don't want to hear about that, we don't agree with that. It doesn't reflect consensus, it doesn't reflect a move towards consensus. However, we think it's important because it may help move there. Without this, I think we would still turn in circles uh, with the different approaches. So the idea here is for the Secretariat to do its job and try to spell out what could be done under Pillar 1, and the focus is under Pillar 1 because under Pillar 2 we haven't had competing approaches. We have a number of factors which need to be further elaborated, uh, on which there are some hard decisions to be taken, but we don't depart from the program of work adopted in June, while under Pillar 1 we need um, to have something like um, um, uh, uniting or unifying uh, these approaches. So, Secretariat work, and this work will be presented to the G20, actually has been presented to the G20. What we made public today is the Secretary General's report report to the G20 finance minister. ministers, as you know, they will be meeting on the 17th of October in Washington, on the sides of the full meetings of the IMF and the World Bank, and uh, we made public this report. And you will find in this report a narrative, and annexed to the report, you will find, or you have found, a note which explains what the unified approach under Pillar 1 is. In the narrative, of course, you have an update on Pillar 2 and a couple of paragraphs on the impact assessment. So, the work which has been done, you can see it on the chart uh, on the slide, is about economic analysis. We've collected data, we've started analyzing the data, we are struggling with lack of data, as always with economists, there is a question of, of uh, how much uh, information uh, you can work with, uh, but we've made significant progress. Uh, on that front, and Osa will mention that uh, to you all, uh, on that front we still have a lot of work to do, and the outcome uh, the assessment will depend on a number of hypotheses which still need to be decided upon. So what we have is a trend. And the other difficulty we have there is that there are country-specific data that we need to cross-check with the countries, which means that we haven't been able to come out publicly with detailed data, but we, as planned, intend to do it by year-end. Pillar 1, as I indicated, the proposal of the Secretariat for a unified approach, which will consist of a scope, new nexus, profit allocation rules, 
how you articulate this new layer with existing transfer pricing rules, and finally, how do you plug tax certainty in the system? And as regards Pillar 2, deploying the program of work as announced. Um, and if we get into the details of the profit allocation rules beyond the scope and the nexus, then you have uh, a three-tier system, three-tier mechanism that will be known as amounts A, B, and C, and Richard and Sophie will drive you uh, through them. The goal is to reach a consensus-based solution which would fix problems in the long term. Some have said that uh, we are gradualists, uh, that the OECD is canonizing gradualism. I think it's Joseph Stiglitz in a pretty critical paper who said so. Well, uh, it, it sounded ironic, uh, but maybe this is indeed what we are doing, because we are not writing books for the shelves. We are not trying to tell what the world should do in, an ideal, cir in ideal circumstances, but what can be reached, how we can effectively change the rules so that we have a better system which is agreed by everybody and which changes things in practice. So that's the goal of our work. Again, a secretariat proposal for your consideration and I think it's important to highlight that this paper is now out for public consultation, for comments, we'll go back to the deadlines, but we will have a meeting at the end of November to take stock of all the comments made, because it's absolutely key to have all stakeholders' input in our reflection, so that we can move forward with something which could be politically agreed in 2020 and which would make sense. On that, I will turn to uh, Richard for him to present uh, the, uh, un this unified approach under Peter One. The first point I'd like to make about the Secretariat proposal is that it is designed to achieve or lead to a consensus solution. So obviously it's shaped according to what delegates, or what it's considered delegates might agree to. As Pascal's mentioned, it's based on commonalities of the existing uh, three proposals that he referred to. Most fundamentally, uh, that means that it's contemplating a reallocation to market or user jurisdictions. But there are also other elements that are, co that are common to all three proposals. For example, having a nexus without the requirement for a physical presence and going beyond the ALP and using simple formulaic approaches. However, it's also true that there is no appetite at all to sweep away the existing ALP. So in those constraints, uh, the proposal has been developed. If I turn to the unified approach, uh, the objectives, uh, you can see the objectives on the slide. Uh, obviously, we're creating a new taxing right, uh, allocating uh, taxing rights to the market and user jurisdiction, and trying to do that in a way that achieves least complexi complexity at every stage. Because we're not sweeping away the ALP, we need to find a way of coexisting with the ALP and limiting the disruptions of the point of connection. And obviously a, a very important part of the package as a whole is to avoid double tax and do something about tax disputes leading to a consensus. Uh, that, obviously, that last point is particularly critical. Now, I just want to mention how we plan to coexist with the ALP? How does the new approach coexist with the ALP? Obviously, we've got to design a new approach. We need an infrastructure for the new approach, but we clearly need to deal with the interaction. And the way we propose to do that is to basically approach the new income allocation system, the new taxing right, uh, as an overlay to the ALP. Uh, at and in the process, limiting that overlay to the greatest extent possible. So we're creating the overlap or the interconnection of the two systems, the existing ALP system and the new uh, taxing right, at what we see as the weakest part of the ALP system, namely where residual profits exist. What that means is that we're looking to target the upper level of profitability of the more profitable companies as the point where we deal with that interaction. Uh, as I say, the new system is therefore an overlay or partial overriding at that particular point. 
You'll see on the slide the building blocks of the unified approach. Scope, the new nexus rule, new profit allocation rules, and then uh, building blocks on the elimination of double taxation and robust tax disputes, uh, uh, prevention and resolution. The core elements are essentially that we're creating a new taxing right, we're trying to improve the operation of the ALP, and we're trying to improve dispute resolution and prevention. Now, as I've mentioned, the new approach to income allocation goes beyond the existing system in a number of ways. So that means we also need to create a new infrastructure. And we're doing that in the least complex way, or we're trying to do that in the least complex way. So using formulas or formulae and proxy where we can, and generally trying to operate the system of having the least complex step at every stage in the new approach. But that also means there are going to be trade-offs in the application of what we're doing. Let's turn to the elements, uh, these building blocks of the new approach, and let's start with scope. I'm going to hand over to Sophie. Thank you, Richard. Let's describe uh, first the two critical dimension or two of the critical dimensions of uh, the unified approach, scope and nexus. Which companies will be in and which company will be out? We are looking at uh, here uh, large size M&E groups or businesses, uh, large in the sense that of their global revenue. And now what activities will be covered into that proposal? We're looking particularly in, uh, to enterprise that are likely to derive meaningful value from interactions with consumers and with users in market jurisdiction. So, of course, highly digitalized business model will be covered, uh, intermediation platform, online advertisement, but also beyond digital, we'll look at consumer-facing businesses, and it could include some business-to-business -business, uh, activities, <coughs> such as sales of consumer product through intermediaries. When we design scope, and uh, it's important to make sure that we are not catching into the net some businesses or some activities and industries for which it will make no sense to be taxed under this model. So as we design scope, we're very mindful that we need to examine other industries and the impact on those. Now, if we have an MNE group that is within the scope or a, a large section of their activities that is within the scope, we now need to assess what is the connection with, between that uh, group in a particular market jurisdiction. So this is where we are looking at nexus rules. Now, these new rules will not be constrained by traditional or existing physical presence to establish a nexus. We will look at different measures of the m and &E group uh, interaction with the particular market. It has to be a sustained and significant involvement with that economy. We will look at a revenue threshold, for example, as an indicator. Um, in looking at those revenue thresholds, um, uh, it's important to calibrate this threshold with the re respective size of market jurisdictions and their economy. But we are also examining different um, uh, factors such as the time threshold too. Are we looking at a, a more than one year picture of the m and &E activity with particular market? We're also looking at other indicators of activities that are in scope, so activities related to the users, to the consumers, and uh, looking at whether they are carrying on those activities in those markets. What is also important for us is not to disturb the existing system in bilateral treaties and, uh, for example, the concept of permanent establishment that exists there as a nexus. What we are looking at here is more of a global uh, assessment of the activities of a group 
and the application of this uh, provision in many different uh, co uh, countries. So um, we are avoiding using concepts or changing existing concepts in bilateral treaties of permanent establishment that would create a uh, spillover effect. Now that we have an m and &E in scope and we have identified nexus with particular market jurisdiction, the next question is how much profit would be allocated uh, or that uh, country will be entitled to tax? Picking up the profit allocation issues, uh, Pascal already mentioned that we uh, look at three, uh, sorry, we look at three types of uh, return, amount A, amount B, and amount C. These individual elements correspond to what I described as the core elements of the proposal. Namely, A is to do with the new taxing right, B concerns uh, the improvement of the uh, existing ALP system, and C is about addressing dispute resolution and prevention. Let me tell you a little bit more about how uh, Amount A works. Uh, when we talk about the new profit allocation approach, it's really Amount A that's dealing with the new taxing rights, so it makes most sense to focus on that first. What we'd like to do uh, is use group consolidated accounts and we'd like to isolate the, uh, the figures in, in that by, business line, by a business line approach, using a, uh, taking a profit number that relates to the business line itself. We then proceed in, by reference to the steps that are indicated on the, on the slide. We start with the total profits. We exclude a portion of that profitability that is deemed to reflect routine profits. That will be a given percentage. And then in relation to the excess, we take a portion of that excess and allocate it to the market or user jurisdiction. In our terms, that would be equivalent to the upper portion of profitability that I referred to earlier on. You'll see that, that the approach is illustrated in a diagram form on the slide to the right-hand side. What that's showing is that the, the portion of the deemed residual profit is then allocable to market jurisdictions. I'd like to emphasize two points. First, that we are seeking to use proxies and a, an approach of deeming, uh, deeming routine profit and deeming residual profit. This is not an effort to reflect actual computational interaction with the transfer pricing affairs of the group. And secondly, the threshold levels that we're talking about, for example, the threshold level at which the deemed routine is, is uh, assumed to apply, uh, or the portion that would be allocable to the market or user jurisdictions is yet to be agreed. If I now turn to amounts B and C, unlike amount A, these do not create any new taxing right. Amount B is concerned with improving the existing transfer pricing system, and it's intended to apply to marketing and distribution functions. And the goal here is to try and avoid facts and circumstances analysis by the use of an approach using fixed returns. And we're exploring different ways in which that might be achieved. What we contemplate is a baseline level of activities that would form the core of a fixed return approach uh, and the use, as I say, of fixed returns, uh, probably by industry. Amount C, on the other hand, recognises that any, any such approach uh, will not deal with all activities and functions in jurisdiction. And what C is, is trying to do, what Amount C is doing, is trying to address the certainty, uh, a certainty agenda uh, of dispute prevention and resolution in relation to what other activities take place in the market jurisdiction. I should stress that this approach of trying to deliver certainty and dispute resolution applies across the package of A, B, and C. When I refer to certainty, the certainty agenda, I think that predominantly refers to amount A and trying to make sure that amount A is calculated and administered in a way that's as certain as possible. The dispute resolution and prevention agenda is particularly relevant to existing dispute, uh, which is, is the target of, of the, the goal. 
Now, inevitably, with so many, uh, with so much uh, new uh, infrastructure required, there is ongoing work in a number of areas. The slide gives a number of indications of areas where we're doing some further work. Uh, there are a number of other matters. This is giving a flavour uh, of the various points. I should also mention that there's quite a lot of work going on in exploring the certainty and dispute resolution or dispute prevention mechanisms that I've just referred to. Uh, and this will be going on for some time uh, in the near future. I guess we're moving on to the, uh, the Pillar 2, um, the GLOBE proposal. If you were looking for a paper on Pillar 2 today on our website and you didn't find it, that is not surprising. Uh, this is an update. Uh, this is an update. So today, uh, the news flash, in some sense, is on, on Pillar 1. I'll give you a brief update on where we are on Pillar 2. Um, first, I guess, as Pascal has said, uh, they, they do come together. The, the Pillar 1 is a question of where you tax. Uh, the Pillar 2 is a question of whether large businesses are taxed. So it's a question of minimum taxation, as it's been referred to, but not in terms of an allocation, but overall as to whether, in fact, there is, at least as it says here in the first bullet point, a certain minimum level of tax that all internationally operating businesses should pay. Um, this is a slide that you've seen for those that regularly tune in, so I'm just going to go through. This is the rationale that's been stated uh, for the pillar. So it is that there is a minimum of level of tax to be paid on the international income of all internationally operating businesses to address remaining BEPS issues. Um, there is a concern. There's a concern that you see reflected in the Pillar 1, but also in the Pillar 2, that may be under the current transfer pricing rules in certain circumstances, a very modest level of substance can attract significant residual profits. Um, uh, so that, again, a concern also here. There's also a certain degree, perhaps, of unhappiness of where we ended up on Action 3. Um, the CFC rules, that was largely a descriptive piece of the BEPS action plan. And so, so that's something where countries are also reflecting that maybe there are remaining BEPS issues that should and need to be addressed. There's the alternative reality, the hypothetical that we are seeing also that we're not doing anything, um, that we may have uncoordinated rules, those that seek to address tax base, those that then against those seek to defend against the attraction of a tax base, and we may then avoid by having a multilateral solution, we may avoid the proliferation of these uncoordinated rules that otherwise would probably live out in, in more complexity and more over taxation. There's also a point that's been made, and this is in the program of work from which we are not departing in any way, we're working on it, that it may also assist developing countries by reducing the pressure on granting certain tax incentives by removing the incentives for company to ask for those. So there is also indirect advantages that we reflect in the design of this pillar. It's a pillar that, as it says here, it is not limited specifically to the digital economy, um, because it is something that more widely addresses profit shifting, widely from intangibles and, and not ring fenced. And of course, linking it a bit to the action three also, it also picks up recent tax policy developments, in particular, the enactment in the United States of the so-called guilty regime, the beginnings of which, for those that read the action three report, you can actually read in there already. So if I move on from the rationale to the brief overview, and, and you've seen this, um, it is a combination of a rule set. The idea here is to have interconnecting rules that together as a system ensure um, that there is a minimum level of tax being paid by the interplay of these rules. There's first an income inclusion rule, something that many countries already have in the form of CFC rules, so the basic tools are known to, to many countries, advisors, stakeholders. There's then a switchover rule. Uh, I think that's a very specific rule that is relevant only for those countries that in their treaties commit to the use of the exemption method as opposed to doing this under domestic law. So that's, I think, a, a rather specific rule. And then there's the undertaxed payment rule um, that several countries, I think it's fair to say, see as, if you wish, a backstop to an income inclusion rule. You can call it a defensive rule. So some countries do see this as a backstop, as something that protects against inversions that's intended to create a level playing field. And then last, there is a subject to tax rule that, that probably sits on a slightly varied rationale 
of situations where, for instance, in a bilateral tax treaty, one may have ceded particular taxing rights on the assumption that the income uh, that is benefiting from the treaty that I have ceded certain taxing right would be taxed or would be taxed certainly at a certain minimum level and where those assumptions are not borne out, then this rule could come in. So that's an overview over the rules. And in telling you, and this is perhaps sort of the update part on where we are, um, this is a selection of key issues currently under discussions. There's a long list of issues. In fact, I will be leaving you after uh, this session because I have to return to the working party where we're currently working on the pillar. So there is ongoing discussions in uh, the technical bodies, both with concerns treaties as well as uh, the, the general work in the so-called Working Party 11 on the design of switchover and the subject to tax rule, how wide they are, how are they constructed, how do they link, what are the particular conditions. Um, we are actively, in fact, today in a discussion on the design of the income inclusion and the under tax payment rule. And the questions um, that you see here on the slide are the questions that we're currently discussing. For the terms of the base of this inclusion rule, what is the base? We are exploring the use of financial accounts. We're doing this as a simplification because we recognize that if we were to look to the rules of the shareholder jurisdiction, that would raise complexities. It would raise compliance questions for businesses that would have to recompute all of their earnings and profits in accordance with the rules of the shareholder. And even if that is already the rule under certain CFC rules, they typically don't have as wide a scope. And so there would be a potential increase in compliance cost. That's something we're thinking of whether we can address. There's also issues of using different tax base that maybe it wouldn't result in a level playing field. There are different tax bases that may have different results. And so while we have agreed to have a top-up system, we have agreed that we have a system that tops up to one fixed percentage. If the base on which this rate is applied would be significantly different, we may not fully achieve the objective that we're seeking. There's also one other aspect that one needs to mention that if we were to look at the domestic tax base of the shareholder jurisdiction, we may pick up circumstances where there are just differences in the tax base, but not of a kind that drove the policy rationale of the pillar. And so I think we are seeking to control for some of the difference in the tax base that are not specific to the underlying tax policy objective that the pillar is seeking to achieve. So that's one big group of questions we're currently discussing. Second is we're discussing the different forms of blending. What type of blending should we allow? Blending is seeking to express the concept of to what degree do you allow the blending of low tax and high tax different sources of income? Do you allow it on an item by item basis only? Do you allow it on a regime basis, on a scheduler basis? Do you allow it on an entity basis, on a consolidated group basis, on a jurisdiction basis, or potentially on a global basis? Um, there's different models. No decisions, importantly, have been taken here. So we're in a process of discussing the pros and cons of various uh, concerns. We are aware that um, if we are going to a smaller type of blending, there is significant uh, compliance concerns uh, that may be less so in the case of a, a global blending regime, but this is currently under discussion. Finally, we're also discussing questions of carve-outs. Should there be carve-outs? And if there should be carve-outs, what types of carve-outs? How would we construct them? Can we also rely on the experience of countries that may already have carve-outs? And what might this look like? Um, so there is the sorts of questions we're discussing at the moment. Um, let me then conclude by the, the uh, next one, um, uh, coordination rules. Um, we are aware and conscious that we cannot apply these rules at the same time. We have agreed that we operate within a framework um, that seeks to minimize double taxation and that seeks to tax no more than the actual profit generated by the transaction. So we have agreed that these rules will not be applied at the same time and at the moment we are in the process also to discuss rule order, which rule goes first and then which rule steps back. Um, and I think we're also clear that this is important at the conceptual level. 
but it's also important at the operational level so that we ensure that not only agree, do we agree the rule order, but then also that we effectively implement that rule order. And then last, uh, and this is the point I think that we've also made um, in what we have released today, there will be a public consultation on these issues uh, related to Pillar 2. We are planning, but currently discussing, to release a paper in November and hope to then see you uh, stakeholders that are interested for a public consultation in December. And with that, I hand it over to you. So <clears throat> turning to the economic analysis, so first to follow up what Pascal said, this is work in progress and it will be refined as the pro project goes forward. So at this stage we had made use of a range of different assumptions and on uh, the proposals and the parameters of the proposals. So this is without prejudging what the final outcome will be. So what our preliminary analysis suggests uh, is that the combined effect of the pillars one and two would lead to a significant increase in global tax revenues. What the work suggests is that Pillar 1 involves a significant change to the way tax and rights are allocated across countries, and it would also lead to a modest impact in tax revenues. Furthermore, our work suggests that low- and middle-income economies, they tend to gain relatively more revenue than advanced or high-income countries from Pillar 1, whereas investment hubs, they tend to experience significant losses in tax base. We also done some further detailed analysis of firm level data, and this work suggests that multinationals in digital oriented and intangible intensive sectors, they would be significantly impacted by both pillars. Turning to the work we've done on understanding the implications for investment, our preliminary work here, again, it will be refined as the project goes forward, suggests that the overall package would not adversely affect the investment environment. And this is because the work suggests there will be an overall impact on the forward-looking effective tax rate would be modest. And that is because many multinationals would not be impacted by the packages. And furthermore, the work suggests that both pillars would reduce the dispersion of tax rates across jurisdictions, and in this way reduce incentives for multinationals to engage in profit shifting by exploiting tax rate differentials. And furthermore, it's important to keep in mind that in contrast, inaction could lead to a further increase in tax uncertainty. And this will have an impact on a business and investment environment and could have an impact on the future for investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Osa, for uh, this presentation. We are fully aware that what we're sharing with you are just trends, high level uh, description of uh, the findings, uh, but again, we started this work uh, late May, early June, and I think you will all appreciate that it's a very short timeline uh, to deliver something uh, yet detailed and uh, fully reliable, which is why we prefer to stick at this uh, high level. Um, I would like to say a few words about the, the next steps. Immediate next step is the G20 finance ministers meeting, which will be held on the 17th of October in Washington. Uh, we know that there will be no communique uh, because that's a, a short uh, G20 finance ministers meeting, as is always the case uh, when it's back to back uh, to the spring or the full meetings of the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, but we may expect a press communique and we hope that there will be uh, support uh, for this approach or encouragement to move move these forward in the context of the inclusive framework. Um, there will be, uh, or there has already uh, been, a public consultation on the unified approach. Keep in mind, it's a secretariat proposal, and feel free to comment as necessary on the scope, on the nexus, on the profit allocation, on the articulation with the existing standards, on the tax certainty. We need your input to make sure that when 
At this point in time, we are drafting the blueprint uh, of an architecture. Uh, we get it right, that we don't miss anything, that we don't get it wrong. So it's extremely important for civil society, for businesses, for any other stakeholders to be able uh, to uh, flag any issue uh, or to provide advice. Uh, as regards uh, the Pillar 1 consultation, um, we started it today and we expect written comments by the 12th of November. My plea here is shorter and more relevant will be better than longer and less relevant. Uh, last time we received thousands of pages, we're fine, we worked them out, but please focus on what is key that will be much more uh, valuable uh, to us. There will be a meeting to debrief uh, all this on the 21st and 22nd of November in Paris, and uh, there will be a meeting of the task force on the digital economy at uh, that point point in time. As regards Pillar 2, as Arim indicated, uh, we have not yet started the public consultation, uh, but uh, we will do soon, early November, a paper should be out, and we'll probably have a meeting mid-December to take stock of the comments uh, made throughout the public consultation. The other step will be the meeting of the inclusive framework at the end of January, where you have all the countries at the appropriate level to meet and what is expected is that some form of the uh, sketch of an architecture, the outline of an architecture could be agreed, maybe without prejudice or maybe even better, some elements could be agreed in January. The more we can get, the better off we are. You can see that there are questions everywhere. I mean, you listened to uh, Richard and Sophie on Pillow One. Our approach is a very tentative draft, but we need to move fast. And we are confident that we can move fast if we have the political support, if we have the political engagement of all countries. And of course, the right solution will be the one that countries can agree upon. It may not be the best, it may not be the one that uh, people in, on their desk in their office uh, not having member countries to deal with would draft. Um, but what matters is that countries would agree something that they would then implement. Uh, there is no need to change the rules if the US, which is a key partner where you have a number of companies, is not in a position to agree. There is no way to design a solution where a number of European countries would say we walk away. There is no way to design a solution where big emerging economies would walk away, either China or India or Brazil or a few others. There is no way to design a solution where a number of developing countries would say there is nothing in there for us and we don't like it. So what we try to do with this Secretariat proposal is to provide elements which could serve these different conflicting interests in a way where countries could agree. And this is what we will pursue in the coming months. There is this inclusive framework in January, there will be another one in June 2020, which means that between now and June we could refine all these elements. We could also uh, facilitate a conversation on the numbers, on the figures, as Richard indicated to you, we are deeming something to be residual profit, to be reallocated to the market. What is the level of profitability above which there would be a reallocation to the market? This is something to be decided by countries. What is the quantum, the portion of the residual profit to be reallocated to the market jurisdiction? To be discussed, as well as many other elements, such as the delineation of the scope if there is agreement that the right direction is indeed to go towards consumer facing businesses. And to guide the work between now and the inclusive framework meeting, we will have a number of meetings of the steering group of the inclusive framework. You can find on our website the composition of the 24 members, uh, the names of the 24 members of the steering group, but you have pretty wide diversity 
of membership with many G20 countries, with a number of developing countries, Senegal, Ivory Coast, uh, Nigeria, Jamaica, Georgia, uh, with small open developed economies like Singapore, the Netherlands or Belgium. So all this work is taken care of now by the steering group, by the task force on the digital economy, which will be meeting in uh, November, back to back to the debrief for the public consultation by the working parties, even though we're a bit in a rush and we have new fundamental questions. But what matters is that we identify all the issues so that we can revise, hopefully in January, the program of work under Pillar 1, if there is agreement on what uh, the blueprint of a solution could look like, then we'll be able to redeploy the technical solutions with a goal to reach a solid political agreement with all the stakeholders as regards Pillar 1, with all the stakeholders as regards Pillar 2, because both pillars are intertwined, so that uh, we can have uh, this agreement uh, in the course of 2020, which will then lead to reflecting on how we can implement, uh, and you have some ideas that you will find uh, uh, in the program of work, uh, referring to different instruments for a proper and simultaneous implementation across countries. I think it's time to move to the questions. We would like to thank you for your attention and bearing with us uh, so far. And I would like to uh, turn to um, uh, Richard uh, on the first question, uh, which is about uh, commodities from farming. Sorry, I'm reading from my phone. Commodities from farming uh, will they be um, uh, dealt with as extractive industry, B2B, or consumer-facing businesses, Richard? Well, of course, uh, we recognise there are going to be questions like this that test the borders of what we're proposing. Uh, and, and, of course, it's a little frustrating that we can't clarify all these issues instantly. However, a number of these issues are already the subject of work in progress and we're trying to develop options and, and different ways of looking at, at these uh, borderline issues. Some are going to be testing uh, and we may actually have to make some trade-offs uh, in the way we approach these borderline issues and in, in the way I referred to in my main comments. So uh, it's, it, it, there's no way that we can uh, respond to all of these individual points right now, but they are well understood that we need to address them. So I'm, I'm going to duck the question with the general response that what we're doing is working on these borderline issues, and we understand that in the process they're all going to need to be answered. Thank you, Richard. And I would just like to add to this response that we're talking about a secretariat proposal, so that's for member countries to decide. And our proposal is to deal with consumer facing, because that's where there is a sustained engagement with the market. There is a rationale there, which would justify that something like the marketing intangible be allocated to the market. That covers primarily B2C transactions. But as indicated earlier, it does cover some B2B transactions. If we take it that... Uh, companies highly digitalized like Google uh, is actually selling advertisement to other companies and not to final uh, consumers. So um, we would cover these business models. So it's broader than B2C. And of course, there are some peripheric issues which are extremely important as the one uh, which was mentioned in the question and on which uh, we are working. Now, we have another question, which is what is the rationale to carve out extractive industries? Uh, well, it seems pretty logical, I would say, uh, because they are not uh, B2C in spite of some companies um, in the extractive world having tried to engineer marketing functions uh, which have been highly disputed by tax administrations by the way but fundamentally you are not in the b2c uh, world one uh, two i think there is some economic theory which would explain that uh, the rent linked to extractive uh, is actually linked to the territory where you have the extractive and not to the market. So that's why even in the destination-based cash flow tax, which was designed uh, by some economists and discussed in the context of the US tax reform, extractives uh, were carved out, at least in the, uh, in the, in the design uh, by the economy. So here there is a strong uh, reason. And then you will have a number of industries which may be in between and on which we will be working 
working if countries agree to take our proposal as the basis for further uh, work. Another question for Richard, which is about the threshold of 750 million uh, to be in scope. How would you manage the cliff edge effect there? Uh, and I would say that it's probably not that different from what was done under Action 13 and the country by country reporting. But please, Richard, could you please elaborate a bit further? Well, I'd make two, two comments really. Firstly, we haven't made a final decision on the thresholds, but uh, we are contemplating various thresholds. Uh, and then secondly, if, if we were to, to use the 750 million, then obviously, as Pascal says, there's been quite a lot of work done uh, within the earlier Action 13 report that would be very helpful. And that includes uh, managing the, the threshold, the definitions that be required, and so on. So all of that would be quite useful. Thank you, Richard. I think we do not have further questions. I take it that we were extraordinarily clear in our presentation, unless that may be another option that we've hammered you with something a bit complex to digest because it's very rich. Uh, one of the criticisms we heard was this is adding complexity to an already very complex system. And I would say, yes, tax is complex. And uh, it reminds me of some conversations with uh, people telling me, oh, it's very complex. And then I start presenting and they say, oh, under amount B, will you do many different sectors? Or amount A, will you take one or several different rates? So you can see that people add complexity every time they talk about uh, this approach or any other approach. So we need to be careful that uh, simplification or simplicity is really compatible with tax. If we want a fair system, it needs to reflect the diversity of the world. That said, one of the guiding principles of this Secretariat proposal is to improve tax certainty for taxpayers, but also for tax administrations. And for tax administration, we would achieve this with more simple rules, simpler rules to ensure that it's easier to administer. This is true in particular for developing countries. And developing countries are a majority of the members of the inclusive framework, and they have stated this loud and clear. So the rules must be as simple as possible to be administered by all countries, starting with those which do not have much resource to implement complex international tax rules. So simplicity, tax certainty, and uh, stabilizing the system are some of the guiding principles of this approach. We hope that you can digest this before uh, starting commenting on this project. You have a few weeks until the 12th of November uh, to share your comments. I invite you to look at uh, the comment that the G20 finance ministers will be making. Uh, we invite you to share with us uh, your views, including on the impact assessment, because I know that a number of you are very much interested in this. And I invite those of you who ask questions about FATCA and the CRS um, to keep them for another uh, tax talks. This was not the purpose uh, today, so I will not respond to this one. I will just inform you that the Global Forum on Transparency will celebrate its 10th anniversary, I think, on the 26th of November. So that's relevant for this topic of transparency. And by then, I wish you all a good day, a good evening, a good night, uh, if you join us from uh, Asia, and uh, I would like to thank my co-panelists and uh, looking forward uh, to talking to you again soon with further progress. Thank you very much. <laughs>